previously in class, I showed you how to express the Lagrangian in spherical coordinates. And today I'm going to work through an example problem uh, using those spherical coordinates. And you'll see why uh, doing things with those coordinates can be easier than using Cartesian coordinates. So the problem we're gonna look at today is a bead on a rotating hoop. And so the picture looks like this. So you have this circular hoop of radius big R. And on this hoop is a mass M. And this hoop is rotating about this axis at a speed of omega. And so now this speed is free to move uh, along this hoop. So it could follow this red path. So the bead is free to travel anywhere along that circular path. And the point of this problem is to, so first we'll use the Lagrangian to describe this object's motion, to describe the bead's motion. And then two, using what we find from the Lagrangian, uh, we will uh, find some stable, so I guess first we'll find some equilibrium points in the solution. And then for three, we'll test those equilibrium points for stability. So we'll determine whether the uh, equilibrium point that we find is stable or unstable. Okay. So for this as our picture, let's see if we can write down the Lagrangian in Cartesian and then spherical coordinates. So if this is our radius R, mass M, in Cartesian coordinates, and this is rotating like this, in Cartesian coordinates, our Lagrangian looks like this, one half M, X dot squared plus Y dot squared plus Z dot squared minus mg z, assuming that our coordinate system is z pointing up, y pointing to the right, and x coming out of the page or out of the screen. Okay, so this is our Lagrangian in Cartesian coordinates. And we've seen in Lagrangian or in spherical coordinates, our Lagrangian looks like this. One half M R dot squared plus R squared theta dot squared plus 
r squared sine squared theta pi dot squared. And then we still have this mgz term that we need to deal with. Now in, obviously the Z is not in spherical coordinates, so we need to convert that. And so to convert that potential into spherical coordinates. So if you look at our picture, draw it in red, this was our origin. And so if we define this as the place where the potential energy is zero, Then when we convert our potential to spherical coordinates, uh, if you remember from last video, if you want to convert the z coordinate, uh, you do r times cosine theta. But now because of where we've defined the potential energy to be zero, there needs to be a negative sign out in front of this. So this negative sign is uh, due to where we have defined the potential energy to be equal to zero. And so when you plug that into your Lagrangian, now you get one half m r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta phi dot squared plus m g r cosine theta. So now let's take our Lagrangian and plug in the conditions that are given to us in the problem. So because the bead is, is constrained to stay on this hoop, um, there is no motion in the r direction. So r dot r is equal to capital R and that's a constant, so r dot is zero. Then um, this rotation omega is aligned in the phi direction so phi dot is a constant and we're gonna call that omega. And so when we plug that into our problem, now or into our Lagrangian, we now have, so r dot is zero. So then we have r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta times omega squared plus mg r cosine theta. And so now if you look at our Lagrangian, the only term that has a variation in time is theta. So instead of dealing with Cartesian coordinates where we would have x, y, and z varying in time, now we have just one variable theta variant. So by using spherical coordinates, we've reduced the complexity of our problem greatly. So now we have this Lagrangian.
Okay. Taking our derivatives for the Euler Lagrange, the partial derivative with respect to theta dot is m r squared theta dot. And then taking the time derivative of that gives you m r squared theta double dot. Now the theta term is going to have uh, the theta derivative is going to have two terms. So the derivative of sine squared is two sine cosine. So that two is going to cancel out with the one half and you'll get m r squared sine theta cosine theta times omega squared. And then the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this will be negative m g r sine. So putting that all together in your Euler Lagrange, you get m r squared. So total time derivative of partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to theta dot equals partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to theta. m r squared theta double dot equals m r squared sine theta cosine theta omega squared minus m g r sine theta. Okay, so now we can see every term has an m in it. So all the m's cancel. We've got an r in every term. And so we wanted to isolate theta double dot we would divide both sides by r and you get sine theta cosine theta omega squared minus g over r sine theta. So now we have a, a representation for the motion of the bead with respect to the angle theta. And we can simplify this equation a bit. So we started with this. So there's a sine theta in both terms. So we can factor that out. Mega squared cosine theta times g over r. And now if we do a bit of testing, so if, if omega squared equals zero, so you have your bead, but it's not rotating, then theta double dot equals negative g over r sine theta. So this looks exactly like A harmonic oscillator. And what why it looks like that is if this is your hoop and your bead is in red, then your bead is just basically going to follow this path along the hoop, go to whatever point it started with, or go to whatever height it started at, and then go back the other way. And it'll follow that path, oscillate just like a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so that's one uh, scenario, but that's not the interesting scenario because we want to know what happens when the hoop is rotating. Uh, but this is a good sanity check to see if what you've solved uh, actually makes sense when you start plugging in some boundary conditions. So this is good, but uh, let's keep going. 
So theta double dot equals sine theta times omega squared cosine theta minus g to the r. Okay. So now let's find some equilibrium positions for this speed. So because we're interested in motion in the theta direction here, the conditions for equilibrium are that theta double dot equals zero and theta dot equals zero. So there's no theta dots in our uh, equation. So that is easy to satisfy. And so the condition that we're most interested in is this theta double dot equals zero. So if we look at our equation above, there's really two ways to make theta double dot equal to zero. So now we'll assume that the, the hoop is spinning, so omega does not equal zero. We already saw what happens when omega does equal zero. Uh, so the two ways that we can make theta double dot equal to zero, first we can set sine theta equal to zero. And so that means theta equals zero or theta equals pi or 180 degrees. And then the other way to make theta equal to zero, so this was first way. The second way would be that omega squared cosine theta equals g of r. And so we can rewrite that as cosine theta equals g over r mega squared. Okay, so those are two, two ways that we can make um, our theta double dot equal to zero. Um, but you can see that within these conditions, there are several possible solutions. And so now we're going to explore those solutions to see whether or not they are stable or unstable solutions. And so first we'll start uh, with this condition one, that sine of theta equaling zero gives us these two theta equals zero or theta equals 180 degrees. So we're investigating this solution. And so let's draw uh, what these two solutions look like. And then you'll be able to guess right away which one is stable or unstable, but then we'll show mathematically which one is which. So maybe in red, I'll do the theta equals pi, which is 180 degrees. So if this is our circle, and we are measuring from this line as theta equals zero, then one solution for the position of the mass is here. And then the other one is at 180 degrees, which is up here theta equals pi or 180 degrees. Okay, so there's two solutions here. 
and you could probably guess right away that the one in black is stable and the one in red is the unstable equilibrium position. But let's explore this mathematically to show why that is the case. So for the unstable point at theta equals pi, let's see what happens if we perturb this position by some small angle delta. So we're going to take theta and convert it to theta plus, or so we're going to plug in pi and then perturb it by some small angle delta. So if we go back to our Lagrangian, um, we had theta double dot equals uh, sine theta times omega squared cosine theta minus g over r. Okay, so if theta goes to pi plus some angle delta, then theta double dot goes to, so pi is just a constant, it's 180 degrees. So if you take two time derivatives of that, you get zero. Um, so we'll just be left with this delta double dot. So this was our Lagrangian. It becomes uh, delta double dot equals sine of pi plus delta omega squared cosine of pi plus delta minus g over r. Okay, now one of the trig identities that can help us out here is that uh, if you add pi to some angle, then the uh, resulting angle is just going to be the negative of that thing. So what I mean is that sine of pi plus delta equals negative sine of delta and cosine of pi plus delta equals negative cosine pi plus delta. So plugging those relationships in to here, we get delta double dot equals negative sine delta times omega squared cosine delta minus g over r. And I forgot to plug in the minus sign here. And so if you distribute that minus sign out, you get sine delta omega squared cosine delta plus g over r. Now, because we said that uh, Delta is a small perturbation. We can use the small angle approximation. So 
So the small angle approximation sine of delta is going to go to delta, and cosine of delta is going to go to one. So now we have delta double dot equals delta times omega squared plus g over r. Now, if you go to solve, so solving this differential equation, because every term on the right-hand side is positive, you're going to get an exponential solution. So what that means is that if you perturb this uh, position from, or this feed from this equilibrium position at uh, theta equals 180 degrees, it's going to quickly move away from that position. So this is an unstable equilibrium position. Okay, so now let's check the other position to show, to see that uh, this one is in fact stable. So doing the same thing as before. Uh, so I'll just skip to this, uh, well, I guess I'll start, um, I'll start over again. So checking the Theta equals zero to see if that's stable. We have delta double dot equals sine of zero plus delta times omega squared cosine of zero plus delta minus uh, g over r. And so now you see, because we're just we're starting at zero, we don't have a minus sign to deal with. And so again, we use the small angle approximation because we've said that delta is a small perturbation. Delta double dot equals delta times omega squared times g over r. So now because this g over r term is negative, uh, when you solve this differential equation, you get a harmonic oscillator, you get oscillations. And because you get something that oscillates, that is defined as a stable equilibrium position. Okay, so now we've checked uh, these two conditions, uh, but now we need to revisit the second condition, uh, which said that when cosine theta equals g over r omega squared, uh, we get another equilibrium position. Uh, so we had this from our Euler-Lagrange equation. And from that, we extracted this condition that if whatever angle, the cosine of whatever angle you're at equals g 
g over omega squared r, then you're at an equilibrium position. And so let's explore this a bit more. So if we look at a graph of cosine theta, it oscillates between one and negative one. So cosine theta has to be less than negative one, greater than equal to negative one. And so that means that if you replace the cosine theta here with one, that if omega squared is greater than or equal to g over r, Uh, we have a, a special condition. And so what, what the special condition is, is that if omega squared is greater than or equal to g over r, then we have three equilibrium positions. We have the two that we talked about earlier. We have theta equals zero and theta equals pi, which was 180 degrees. And now we have a third, so one, two, three. Now we have a third condition that says that omega uh, cosine theta equals g over omega squared. But if omega squared is less than g over r, then we only have two, two equilibrium positions. Equilibrium. being the theta equals zero and the theta equals pi. So we've seen that if omega squared is less than g over r, that this was a stable equilibrium position and this was an unstable equilibrium position. But now let's investigate if omega squared is greater than or equal to g over r. So to do that, I'm going to um, remember these two differential equations. So from theta, so if we do omega squared is greater than or equal to g over r and theta equals zero, now, this differential equation, or this uh, yeah, differential equation looks like this. Theta double dot equals, or delta double dot equals delta times omega squared minus g over r. And so if we plug this condition in here, then this would be theta double dot equals delta times some positive number. And because this is a positive number, we again would get a, so solving this differential equation, we get an exponential. And so 
this is unstable. And now omega squared greater than or equal to g over r. And uh, we look at the uh, theta equals pi. Then uh, nothing's going to change. So the it's the same as what we just wrote down, but the inside term is positive now. And again, uh, if you plug in this condition, uh, this is still some positive number. And so this is still an exponential solution to this differential equation. And therefore it's unstable. Okay, so now we have one more condition to check. So if you look back at this little summary, so we've checked the stability of these two cases. Uh, we've seen that both of these are unstable. And so now the last one to check is this cosine theta equals g over mega squared r. And to do that, we're going to go back to our Euler-Lagrange equation. Sine theta times cosine theta omega squared minus g r. So if we start with this uh, differential equation that we got from Euler-Lagrange, and we have this condition that cosine theta equals omega squared, or g over omega squared r. Let's vary this angle theta and make it go from theta to theta plus some small perturbation delta. And now again, theta will be some constant. And so theta double dot goes to just delta double dot. And so we would get delta double dot equals sine of theta plus delta times cosine of theta plus delta omega squared minus g over r. Okay, so we're varying this angle with respect to um, the small angle delta that we're adding in here. And so now we need to use some trig identities. So do that on the next page. So we've got sine of theta plus delta and cosine of theta plus delta. So there are trig identities that relate uh, how uh, the sine of two angles added together, uh, what those look like. And so for sine, it looks like this, sine, theta, cosine, delta. 
plus cosine theta sine delta. And then for cosine, it's cosine theta cosine delta minus sine theta sine delta. Okay, but now we will remember that delta is small. So for the small angle approximation, sine of delta equals delta and cosine of delta equals one. So using the small angle approximation, this becomes sine theta cosine or cosine delta, which is one, and then cosine theta times sine delta, which just becomes delta. And here, this becomes cosine theta minus uh, sine theta times delta. So if we plug that into our differential equation that we had, we had sine theta plus delta, which becomes sine theta plus cosine theta times delta. We had an omega squared and then a cosine theta plus delta, which became cosine theta minus sine theta times delta minus g of r. Okay, so now we have to do a lot of multiplication. So first I'm gonna do this. times this, okay. So we've got this omega squared term out in front. Now sine theta times cosine theta Before we do that, now I'm going to use the fact that we know that cosine theta equals g over omega squared r and plug that in to those two terms. So now we get theta double dot equals sine theta plus g over omega squared r times delta times omega squared times g over omega squared r minus sine theta delta minus g over r. Let's rewrite it so we can see it on this page. Sine theta plus G delta over mega squared R times omega squared times G over omega squared r minus sine theta delta minus g of r. Okay, so this kind of looks like a mess, but we're gonna multiply all these things together and things will start canceling and we'll be able to clean things up.
pretty neat. Okay, so the sine term times this first term will give us g g sine theta. And then this omega squared will cancel out with this omega squared. And actually, maybe I'm just going to do that now. Um, so this, these guys cancel. And so this is just g over r minus omega squared. And now you see that we've got a So you've got a g over r minus omega squared sine theta delta, and then a negative g over r. So those g over r terms are going to cancel. And now we have much, much less multiplication to do. Okay. So multiply the first term, we get a sine squared theta, get a negative sine, we get an omega squared, and we get a delta. And then in the second term, we get g sine theta omega squared delta squared over omega squared r. Now, a, a common technique to use in physics and mathematics is, um, so we've already said that delta is small. And so because delta is small, delta is much, much bigger than delta squared. So if you take a really small number and you square it, you get an even smaller number. So because of this fact, we're going to ignore the delta squared term. So basically ignore this whole thing. And that allows us to simplify things. So we get theta double dot equals negative sine squared theta omega squared times delta. So because we're varying in delta, if we solve this differential equation, you'll see that the coefficient here is negative. So that means we'll have a harmonic oscillator solution. And therefore, we have a stable solution. So it was a lot of work to get to that, but we've now shown that that is a stable solution. So for the bead on a rotating hoop, we have two conditions. So if omega squared is less than g over r, you have two equilibrium positions. One was at theta equals zero, and that was stable. One at theta equals pi, which is 180 degrees, that was unstable. Then at omega squared greater than or equal to g over r, you had three equilibrium positions. You have the same two as before. These now 
uh, when the hoop is rotating faster our unstable position equilibrium positions and we had one final position at the angle cosine theta is equal to g over omega squared r and we've just shown that that was a stable solution And so basically for slow rotation, you've got one stable position here and one un oops. one unstable position up here. And then for fast rotation of the hoop, both of these are unstable. And so what happens is when this hoop is rotating very quickly and you start at the bottom of the hoop, the bead's actually gonna wanna travel up either side of this hoop until it reaches a stable position somewhere in the middle. So that is the, the in and out of that uh, that's a very deep dive into this problem of a bead on a rotating hoop, but it will serve as a good introduction to um, dealing with equilibrium positions in Lagrangians when we look at Lagrange points for satellites that are orbiting the Earth or orbiting the Sun. And we'll talk about that more in the next class. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.